Hi, I'm Dave Priest, and I'm here with three of the cast members of Critical Role, the online uh, streaming Dungeons & Dragons show, and the growing digital media company. So here we have Travis Willingham, who is the CEO. We have Matt Mercer, who is the Chief Creative Officer, and we have uh, Marisha Ray, who is the Creative Director. Thank you all so much for joining me. Yeah, yeah my pleasure. Us. I just wanted to kind of start off by asking sort of an open-ended question to you guys, uh, which is, if you had to travel back in time 10 years and describe to somebody who is pretty much just familiar with the traditional forms of media, you know, television, film, and so on, what you all do right now, uh, how would you describe that? What, what would be your elevator pitch, you know? <laughs> Ten years person. ago, we have a hard time describing yeah. it now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, if we have the goal of, of making an impact, the, the, <laughs> they have to sit them down for at least an hour to try and get it across. Um, <laughs> I mean, it would be, you know, creating long-form stories through improv and friendship. I don't know. Like, like, I don't know what else to, to describe it, yeah, really. It's like shared improvised storytelling. That hopefully you have four hours a week to watch. Yeah. But ten years stream. ago, there's no Twitch. There's no. There's no internet like that. Not like that. Yeah. Well, ten years ago, especially, it was the era of like three to five minutes on YouTube. Any oh, more than yeah. that, no one will pay attention. So like, I mean, even we going into this, we were like, no one's gonna watch this. So trying to convince people ten years ago, I mean, we would have been half-hearted and been like, yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Now, that said, Travis, I know that, uh, you know, this this show, as it's sort of grown in popularity, you guys have thought about adapting it to into these kind of different media. You have the uh, comic book, you have an animated show uh, that you ran a successful Kickstarter for. Um, but you also uh, pitched that show, I believe, to some studios before you did the Kickstarter for it. I mean, what did those pitches look like? I mean, everybody was really positive. That's kind of the, the funny thing is that there were, you know, excited faces in the room. There were tons of questions. Uh, in a lot of ways, they were like, so wait, it's a D&D &D game. Would the, would the animated series be improvised as well? And we were like, no, this is actually based off of the stories that we've already established. And they're like, man, this is, this is really great. And there's how much? And you're still doing it? And there are all these additional characters? And you could feel the excitement starting to build and then sort of in the end they all said sim similar things along the lines of like, man, this is really great. It it's going to find a home somewhere. Mm -hmm. and you're like, okay, but here? <laughs> right? yeah, yeah, it's tough. It's tough to get these Hollywood execs to take a chance on an IP that in their eyes is not proven yet. Mm -hmm. um, or an original IP, you know, you can have much more success going back to them with something that's already been established in the past and that they can lay those bets on securely. How, how do you think about how this show fits in with the larger media landscape of today? And and what do you think that future landscape looks like? And, and what's your role in that? It's a big question. Yeah. Um, I Personally, I think that when you have a good story and you have a raw story, that story should easily be able to be translated into any medium that people could want to consume it from. We are not disillusioned to the fact that so many people don't have time to watch our four-hour show a week, or those who are engaged in the show or want to become engaged in the show don't often know where they should start, or they're like, wow, this is 500 hours I'm supposed to catch up on? So the comic book or the animated series or any other forms of mediums that we're working in were more or less an opportunity to present these stories in a way that people could digest them to whatever they prefer, to whatever medium that they enjoy. Yeah, and I think it's, it's, it's a testament to kind of where, where most consumers are when it comes to media, that they're engaging with something, not just because it's a good story. There's plenty of media out there that's a good story, but behind it all, it's still just a bunch of friends that get together and play a game. And I think one of the things we stuck with so hard on this the entire time is making sure that that aspect never changes. You know, as much as all of this unexpected, you know, growth and, and success with the show and the channel has, has been, maintaining that the core of it is still about us getting together on you know, every Thursday night and playing a game together just for the sake of us having a good time together. And we think 
and we keep hearing from from the community and people that get in, invested in it that that's part of what brings them back to it is just on top of it all it also feels like coming together with friends you know same reason the let's play has got so popular in recent years is it feels like you're sitting down with a friend and watching them play a video game and hanging out with them there's a lot more of this kind of need for for genuine uh personal contact even through media that i think some people are really connecting with and that's allowing three four hour episodes to still hold people in on top of it just being hopefully a fun story for people to watch as it is for us to play so it's seven friends but it's also seven friends who are professional actors who are playing these roles you know so so part of my question then would be you know as you guys are are doing this, yes, you're playing the game, uh, you know that that is just this Dungeons and Dragons game that you're playing, but it is also this sort of new storytelling medium that you guys are are in. I, I wonder how does your background uh, in acting in various forms, whether it's voiceovers or on stage or in front of a camera or whatever, um, how how is that transferred over? Um, and, and what are ways that it maybe hasn't transferred over quite as directly as you expected? Well, it's interesting. Right when we start, whether it was the first campaign or the campaign that we're currently in, you, you build a character, you create a backstory, and you come up with a personality or a voice in your mind. But just like any role that we have, the more often you perform it, the more evolved the character becomes. It becomes a bit more rounded. Things are added or subtracted from that character and it really starts to take on this shape and of course that shape fits into what everyone else is doing as well so this puzzle piece starts to fit so i think just sort of the the repetition of doing or or being able to play every week certainly builds a a richer story Um, but in voiceover we are uh, restricted by where the microphone is right you have to stay right in front of that sucker you can't move so you're stuck at a table and there's no getting up and swinging a sword or Striking a pose, although I guess we do kind of strike a pose <laughs> from time to time in our, in yeah, our chairs. Yeah, I need my space bubble in the booth. Or <laughs> so we're used to kind of being planted in one space, committing to a voice, committing to a personality, and making choices, like character choices. So that was, I think, for us, like a, a, a sort of a step up. Yeah. Well, yeah. and then when you have all you have to work with is these characters that you've built, and it's all improv storytelling. So you rely on, well, what would the character do in this moment? And I think that makes that's why the, the story is so genuine. And you kind of can't argue with it because it's just we're role-playing people acting as people. So every everything that kind of comes out of it, you're like, yeah, damn, couldn't have written that. Yeah, mm-hmm. and to that degree, too, like being actors, which... No, by no means does anyone have to be an actor to play D anD. d You know, it's what got me into being acting was playing D anD. d I went the other way, um, but uh, we also have trained as performers to be able to comfortably step into other personas, and as voice actors, with very little feedback, we don't have costumes and set pieces to rely upon. It's all up here. You know, it's us in a, alone in a booth or within a few people in a booth. Uh, looking at a microphone and you have to still live in that space. So role-playing games is a very natural transition for us based on, on where we came from and what our, our skill sets we've trained with are. Um, so for us, it's something that it's like a second skin. Um, and that means that we also get to get lost in the moment and be ridiculous, forgetting there are cameras in the room, and for better or for worse sometimes, depending on, <laughs> on, on what we're doing. Um, and and just kind of dive in. Yeah, sitting sitting in on it uh, yesterday was interesting because I, I think that watching the stream, I had never realized how um, just how physically taxing it can be to sit at a table for four hours yeah. while you're being watched by by thousands and thousands of people, um, and <laughs> you know, and uh, and and trying to be engaged, even if your character, you know there may be two characters having sort of a tender moment and you are on the sidelines for it, but you are still, you know, everybody is still very engaged in the story and what their character is doing. And, uh, you know, and everybody has a cup of coffee that they have to to keep that mm-hmm. going. I mean, how is that something that you had to learn? Is that something that you brought from other, you know, media like theater or like stage performance or... At our core, we're an ensemble cast. There's a reason why most writers and directors and filmmakers don't want to mess with an ensemble cast because it's difficult to feel like a you know a cast of six main characters can all get their starring moment. 
Luckily, we have the advantage of having a lot of time on our hands, and this is a very long-running storyline. Um, but I think from episode to episode, we've gotten pretty good at being like, okay, this is Knott's moment, or this is Ford's moment, and we've got pretty good. And it's just as entertaining for us to sit there, and we get to kind of unplug for a second and be spectators and watch our amazing actors, friends, act their asses off. It's uh, super entertaining from both sides. I think that's part of the key, too, there is, like, many times when you come to a game table, especially when you haven't built a rapport you know, amongst the players, everyone is there at the table as a group, but you're really there to play your character and see your character story through. And, like, yeah, these guys might help out a bit. Claire, kill me, cool, but my character story. <laughs> when you've been friends and you've been gaming for a while together, um, you begin to learn to be more invested in what the other people are doing at the table. And because, thankfully, these guys are great performers and they trust me and trust each other enough, uh, especially when we began to, began to get into the, the really kind of more emotional stuff of the first campaign, we now know that even when we're not in the spotlight, cool shit's going to probably happen across the table when they're having their scene together. And there's something really neat about, you know, having other people at the table or not on a scene as excited or engaged and reacting to a sequence or an interaction that has nothing to do with their personal character. That's kind of rare in a lot of game groups that haven't been playing for a long period of time together. And that, that to me is, you know, kind of a, a cool reflection of just our relationships of, you know, we have with each other outside of the game. Too. Yeah. Would, would you say that your role as the dungeon master is at all, especially in a more narrative kind of uh, game of this sort, would you say that your role is at all like a, a director? Are you doing things to try to sort of steer the story's focus in certain ways? Are you doing things to uh, change up pacing to quicken it or slow things down and let it breathe? What? It is very much like a, dir a director role, actually. You're the one who has to gauge if they're entirely lost and they're frustrated, how to drop a hint where they get back on track and feel like they're guiding the story in an excited way. Um, it's your job to cut things if you think it's dragging out too long. You know, there are encounters or things that you're like, ah, oh, this isn't as important for us to enjoy the game and might kind of detract from the, the, the current kind of pace and, and joy we have. So I'll just go ahead and trim that and the players won't know. I'll use it later. Have you ever, uh, have you ever thrown in, say, a die roll to up the tension in a given moment because you see sort of an opportunity for a, a, a narrative ad there? Oh, or, yeah. or is it just for game mechanics' sake? No, no, um, I'll, I'll do it just to mess with them. Uh, roll a d20. Why? Roll a d20. Just do it. Yeah, oh. just ask them to do it. There are times where there's a reason and there are times where there isn't. That keeps them guessing, too. Um, God, I want you guys to, to know which yeah, is which, no, you know, and, know, and it does know. raise the stakes a bit. Um, but, uh, but yeah, p part of that also is, is feeling the kind of where the players are going, what's kind of really hooked them and making them smile and make them excited about the current modes of the story and then helping facilitate that mode as much as you can. Yeah. So when you think about some of those narrative devices or, uh, game mechanic devices that, that help with those elements, how aware of you are, uh, the audience and how audience perception sort of uh, feeds into that? Uh, nowhere near as much as I should, I guess, from, from a you know, professional media standpoint. Um, I'm more focused on the player's enjoyment. I generally don't think about the audience when we're in the middle of a game, because I, I firmly believe the players are having a good time, the audience is having a good time. And you know, while certain episodes can drag a bit based on you know, it's more of an exploratory episode or an information gathering episode and stuff, as long as the players are having a good time, that's all I care about. Um, I guess it's kind of a, a, a belief that that's kind of where the success of any of this lies. So I would say I, I, don't, I don't really consider much of the audience in the moment or just the pace of the story in that consideration. But if I see the players are feeling a bit lost or if the players are getting frustrated with something, then I might shake things up a bit, whether it be throw uh, a sudden wrench in the plans that kind of gets them all awake and spry and focused or find a way to let them discover a hint that guides them on the right path. Um, you know, things like that. But mostly for the players, less for the audience. Yeah. Marisha and Travis, what about, what about you guys? How aware of you are the audience? I was going to say that when we first started, I think you actually did a fair job of reminding us to, like, be ready. Like, be, be quick, right? Because D&D &D can go as long as you want it to. And when we were certainly playing at home, we would play for hours, mm -hmm. right? We'd have brunch, there'd be food, people mm -hmm. get up from the table, leave, come back. 
but we're sitting at the table, we sort of ask everybody to like stay engaged, stay focused, right? And um, if we start getting off on tangents or whatever, he is really good about going, guys, what are you doing, right? So that we're not bored, the audience doesn't get bored, and that's sort of the only semblance of just acknowledging that like, there are people watching and also we just need to sort of keep the, the energy and the momentum going. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we, you know, we've been doing it for years now, so it's, we start doing it to <laughs> we start doing it to each other. Mm -hmm. Like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know? yeah. <laughs> Roll something. Go. Yeah. Yeah. Make a choice. Yeah. yeah. Uh, timer. Yeah. So when this whole Critical Role project started, it seemed like it might you know, die within a few episodes. Uh, but we're now four years on and the, the show is going strong and the, you know, it's not just a show anymore. It's this whole company that is quickly sort of expanding and, and growing in different directions. Uh, can you walk me through a little bit of what that experience has been and, and what you see the future of this uh, show and this company and this medium being? Yeah, uh, <laughs> it's been a lot of just trying to catch up to yeah. it. Like we we never really, we're only in the past year or so beginning to like with the Kickstarter beginning to take some active choices in where we want it, to see it go. Um, most everything else has been just kind of just trying to race behind this rocket we can barely control. You know, it, it's had its own momentum and we just are trying to get ahead of it constantly. So it's been exciting. It's been scary mm -hmm. uh, going into business with your friends, especially when you didn't really mean to, but you had to because it was going <laughs> there regardless and you wanted to, you know, make sure that people you didn't trust got control of it. You know, that's all a very frightening but exhilarating thing to do. And I, I feel very fortunate that this group is the group that made this happen. You know, everyone's kind of fallen into these, these wonderful roles and, and all kind of covered each other's ass through multiple points of its growth. And, um, and now, <laughs> yeah, it's, it, I don't know how else to describe it. It's, it's just screaming into the abyss to see where it takes us and, and trying to find a place to land safely. <laughs> yeah, we, we take a lot of cues from our audience, too. Yeah. Like, when we, when we started at home, I mean, uh, we had, I don't know, fever dreams about, like, oh, this would be a great comic book, or, oh, wouldn't this be crazy as an animated series? Nothing more than that, just conversation over a table. When the stream started and... The audience started to produce this fan art. It really inspired sort of the visual element of like, hey, wait, this could actually be something. These representations, these action moments are visceral and engaging. Maybe we should think about a comic book. Is it crazy to think about yeah. an animated series? Well, we didn't even, I don't think, pursue a comic book originally. No. Dark Horse came to us. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of these opportunities are things that we didn't think would ever in a million years happen. And then all of a sudden show up at our doorstep and we're like, oh, okay. okay. <laughs> So that's that's been really exciting, uh, and as far as the future goes, I mean, where are we on that? Theme park. Yeah, <laughs> I, mean, yeah. I mean, laser light show theme park. We know. VR simulator. <laughs> Holiday. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think when it comes to the future, what we've learned and what Critical Role has taught us, it all kind of goes back to that core of storytelling, and you know, you asking us thinking that it wasn't going to take off after the first few episodes, and then it did. I think about it all the time, and sometimes I think we were, it, it was the combination of right time, right place. I think the cultural zeitgeist kind of needed critical role when we came on the scene. And I, I think that's only further proven itself, and we're going to further see that in the world, especially with the way things are right now. No one is the solution to the fact that we hear horrible things going on in the news all the time. And we've seen with as chaotic and as frenetic as the world is, people are more than willing to sit down and get invested in a good, long story. <laughs> so if we can continue to provide that, I think we're, we're doing okay. And ultimately, it's just kind of been a goal and a mission in the company and with the content that we create to lower the barriers of entry to storytelling, to show people, yeah, man, you can do this too. You go be the hero of your own D&D game. It's great. Well, thank you guys so much for sitting down and talking. Uh, it's really interesting to hear some of these insights uh, and hear it sort of behind the curtain, uh, so to speak. <laughs> um, so, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Travis and, uh, and Matt and Marisha. Yeah, thank you for having me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right.